Welcome, 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 everybody. Today is Thursday, April 6, 2023. My dogs are losing their mind downstairs yelling at fence people. Welcome to episode number 339 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Jeff Fuller, Tim Ferrari, Andy Nakamura, Cyber Ninja, Shakira Williams, Anthony Delco, Carl Wrong, Greg Dustoff, Ken Forte, Terrence Billingsley, David Anderson, and so many more of the Simply Cyber community are going to be shredding through the top cyber news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you as a practitioner. So how can you operationalize this at work this week, next month, for, you know, whatever, Q3 planning. Or if you're looking to break into the industry, thank you very much, Lane. If you're looking to break into the industry, you're going to want to be here. You will be asked in any any job interview for a cyber job, how do you stay current? Daily th- cyber threat briefing from Simply Cyber is a fantastic answer. And if you don't know, now you know. So I am loving it. But before we get into the top cyber news stories, before we get into the Thursday meme of the week, which is another banger from Haircut Fish, who's also the Simply Cyber community challenge holder at the moment, I want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsor, starting with Barricade Cyber Solutions. Get those Barricade Cyber logos out, if you will, squad members. Barricade Cyber Solutions is dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. But Barricade Cyber Solutions knows how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Holler at them at barricadecyber.com. Links in the description below. The website looks like this if you're watching on stream. Remember, you can listen to this on your podcast app of choice. But for those of you who are watching Team Live, Team Replay, this is Barricade's website. The key takeaway here is if you scroll down, Eric Taylor's cell phone number's right there. Or you can get on his calendar, 7.30 p.m. tonight. Have a conversation. Get left of boom with Barricade Cyber and figure out what needs to be in place before you get smacked in the mouth with ransomware. Also want to say shout out and love to Panopsi, entering our second month of sponsorship with Panopsi. Thank you, Brandon Poole and the whole crew over there. Panopsi does a million different wonderful things for businesses from a cyber risk reduction perspective. But one thing I want to share with you is their quantified risk assessment service. Quantified risk assessments are very valuable to businesses if you are looking to mature your information security program or frankly launch an information security program. Because dude, here's the deal. You can spend money all over the place on different things, different tech. Believe this, security vendors will be happy to sell you all of their service offerings. It's all about that straight cash, homie. Straight cash, homie. But a quantified risk assessment methodology will actually enable you to have evidence and statistically sound approaches to where your cyber risk... Uh, Joel Belton with the gifted subs. Holla, 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 Joel Belton. What? Did we just become best friends? A, yep. a quantified risk assessment will allow you to understand that like your risk exposure to, say, a ransomware incident, uh, based on your industry, based on your business size, based on your footprint, is... Very likely, right? Like, so sometimes you'd say very likely, you know, you're in the orange to red area. Ooh, scary. Well, what if I told you, you have a 68 to 84% chance of a risk uh, ransomware incident happening this year to your business? You'd be like, holy crap, that's not good. What do I do? Well, if you introduce PAM or MFA or any of these other solutions, we can bring your risk exposure down significantly to 10 to 14% uh likelihood of a ransomware incident you see how like statistics and evidence based really really helps you make informed decisions this is a quantified risk assessment um also a little bit of a lesson learned on what quantified risk assessments are so give a shout out to panopsi uh if you can links in the description below brandon pool's awesome quantified risk assessments are awesome also much love to xm cyber but i will get more into them at the mid roll guys if you're live right now Drop a hashtag team live in chat. Love it, love it, love it. If you're on replay, replay people are people too. Drop it in the comments. Say hashtag team replay in the comments. I love reading the comments and engaging with y'all um, over there in the in the um, team replay feed. And then finally, my favorite, and I, I just genuinely, genuinely appreciate where this has taken itself. If you are, 
you know, socially introverted, if you're reluctant to step forward, if you're just getting in the industry and you're like, look at all these people chatting right now. Oh my God, they all have something to say. I'm, I'm an imposter. I don't have anything to say. I'll just chill out in the background because it's easy to not engage. Drop a hashtag passive observer in chat. Just do that one thing, hashtag passive observer. Take the first step towards engaging with the community. Believe me when I tell you that networking is the most valuable thing you can do to invest in yourself in your career long-term. Yes, understanding computer networking and what GRC is and all those things are important, but dude, professional networking is critically important. So hey, what's up, Happy Camel? I'll say hi. See, just like that, I shy killer. What's up? Mike Darrington's in this house. What's up, Mike? Meet in the sheet. What's up? Good to see you guys. All right, now let me take one slug off the coffee. I did teach this morning. It is Thursday. Just a reminder for everybody that Thursday, um, Recon InfoSec, who I'm not affiliated with, but I love what they're doing, so I do uh, promote it. They are doing Thursday defensive. Remind me um, at the mid-roll or at the end to uh, remind you guys, and I'll, I'll put a link in everything. My earpiece is kind of being fickle. I don't like that. I'll give you an update on the fence and the shed and the studio during the jaw jacking period. But right now, sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the top cyber news wash over us in an awesome wave. See you guys at the mid-roll. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Thursday, April 6, 2023. Prominent Spanish hacker arrested. Spanish police arrested Jose Luis Huertas, known by the alias Al Caseca, believed responsible for multiple notable cyber attacks in the country. Among other activities, he created the Udyat search engine used for selling stolen personal information. Police launched an investigation into his activity back in November after a network breach at Spain's National Council of the Judiciary that stole a data on more than half a million taxpayers. He's also charged with impersonating a media executive and money laundering. Wow. The UK All right. So 19 year old hacker, you know, he's probably, you know, going to get in a lot of trouble, but likely has a very uh, promising career ahead of him once he gets uh, through this uh, at night. Oh, my God. Um, to have to be 19 and to have this much going on obviously shows prowess. It shows um, skill. Um, oh yeah, of course. Thank you very much, uh, squad members for the chief wigam. I forgot about that. Um, I haven't heard of this uh, Udiat, um search engine that allowed selling of uh, stolen information, but you know, very enterprising. I, I'm glad that. Um, the Spanish authorities got after him. Um, I, you know, it's complete speculation, but I would, I would suspect honestly that he was probably making some opsec errors. Um, usually, younger cyber threat actors, cyber criminals, are, are a little bit more loud, a little bit more boisterous, a little bit more um, noisy, if you will. Okay. Um, so, anyways, long story short, you know, this guy. Oh, he was doing podcasts too. Oh my God, bro. I'll tell you what, I'll, you know what I wouldn't do. I would not have myself on a podcast, um, at all ever. If I was committing crimes, like that's not a good look, not a good move. The, the one, okay. So whatever this person s stole it. I, I don't know anything about anything else other than Spanish authorities and, uh, international law enforcement are holding holding uh criminals accountable which is awesome hopefully the next person like hopefully someone who watched this interview was like oh my god how cool is this guy he's doing podcasts he's a celebrity he's you know making money he's committing crimes very sexy very very cool like hopefully they see him do his little perp walk and go to jail for a period of time and hopefully that deters people from thinking that that's a cool lifestyle um one small thing i will share though is like one of the coolest, uh, not coolest, but like one of the most interesting um, threat actor interviews I've ever seen. Arian Sagetti with the squad membership. What's up, Arian? And thank you to uh, all the people who got picked up as squad members through Joel Belton's, um, Joel Belton's uh, squad member. My dogs are losing their mind right now. Yes, my shirt's backwards. I, I have my camera mirror inverted, so it looks like I'm looking at the story instead of like looking off in that direction. Um, 
if you look at the Phineas Fisher interview, that was that was a brilliant piece of work on having a threat actor do a public interview in a way that was completely secure for the threat actor. Okay, let's keep going. UK's offensive cyber capabilities principles. The UK's National Cyber Force, or NCF, shared its principles that it's used to conduct covert offensive cyber operations. The NCF qualified these by saying it would rarely, if ever, get involved if another response from a government agency would more effectively deal with a challenge from another nation state. Overall, the NCF outlined three principles. Operations need to be accountable, precise, and calibrated. Its operations can include attacks against IT networks and technology to make it either less effective or unable to function entirely. The document further places the NCF's actions within the UK's existing legal framework, attempting to show how the agency assesses targets for escalation or de-escalation. Oh, very cool. All right. So really quick, I'll go over this story, but I'm going to have to step away for a minute and put my dogs in the crates or something. I can't even, like the dogs are going nuts and I literally can't even think clearly. That's how much they're going bananas right now. So uh, this is pretty cool. If you remember, uh, the the UK just released the National Protective Security Authority, which was, in, in my mind, it's hosted by MI5, but it's really like, it feels like CISA because um, it's supposed to help um, agencies deal with state-sponsored threat actors that are targeting UK business. So it's that public-private sector uh, balance. And I'm sure the UK has seen how successful CISA is. Um, I don't know if the UK has a British version of Jen Easterly to run their department, little Jen Easterly emotes. Uh, but, you know, that's certainly been critical. So I love that they're doing this. It sounds like the national, um, you know, the NSA version, if you will, of the UK is opening up a bit about what their operation capability is in order to uh, support and facilitate um, that national protective security authorities mission. So what does this mean to you? Well, first of all, if you work in the UK, this is interesting because you guys, um, defenders, practitioners in the UK are going to have access, I would imagine in the next like 90 days to 120 days, this authority is going to start pushing out uh, useful intel, something that public sector practitioners can leverage. Obviously, they're going to have, they're probably doing information sharing and analysis with this uh, UK NSA group, which is going to better inform them and how they can help the public service uh, group. I almost think of it as like um, a, a really cool like buffer between the public sector, like, excuse me, between the private sector, us as practitioners, and the kind of UK NSA uh, capabilities, right? Like that that group can't directly speak to private sector for, for reasons, but they can go through this buffer of this UK version of CISA, the National Protective Security Authority, in order to get that intel out in a meaningful way. One of the things you really got to remember, guys, is that threat intel is very valuable, but it's timely. Like me telling you about like an impending threat to ransomware in the healthcare space, like that I heard three months ago, like that doesn't do you any good. It needs to be timely. It needs to be actionable. And the the communication vehicles to get it out there need to be well um, established. And that's what they're doing here in the UK. So I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, you know, they have this first of its kind guide that this UK NSA group released. So um, this might be worth a read here. I'll drop a link in chat. This could be kind of fun. Yeah, time sensitive. Um, Alex Goodwin says time sensitive question mark. What I'm saying is if I have intel of an impending threat to financial services or there's an uptick in activity on, um, you know, uh, some type of threat actor group targeting the energy sector in North Dakota. Like if I don't tell you for three months, you probably already got hit and you didn't know any about it. So then the intel doesn't do you any good. Right. That's what I'm saying there. All right. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I'm going to try to go into the mid roll here e-file site serving malware. Believing Computer confirmed that the IRS authorized e-file software service provider e-file.com delivered mm. a malicious JavaScript file All right, I'm sorry. at least April 1st. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll be back in a second. I like uh, genuinely apologize, but this is ridiculous. These dogs. They stopped barking. Oh, they started again. Some users on Reddit report seeing suspicious behavior with e-file as far back as mid-March. 
The file prompts users to download a next stage payload. Popper. Researchers at Malware Hunter team say this payload contained a Windows backdoor that could eventually lead to full access to machines, essentially communicating with the C2 server to enroll the machine in a full botnet. The malware is no longer on the site and did not impact the IRS's e-file infrastructure. Antivirus solutions are also reportedly spotting the malicious file. All right. If you're a regular of the Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, you know full well that we covered this story at length yesterday. So I would just direct you to the yesterday story. I'm not going to spend more time on this. Just be aware that, you know, JavaScript can basically, malicious JavaScript can be inserted if they're able to get control of a page or something or use malvertising. Google the word malvertising and you'll learn more about this type of attack and how it can trick end users basically into running malware or installing malware or in uh, oh my god these dogs one one popular thing i've seen is like you go to a site and it tells you that it can't run unless you install a specific extension for it to work and the extension is just malware you run the extension it it starts running like a crypto jacker or some type of info stealer and then um you're off and running in a bad way so yeah just ben doesn't hear the dogs because i have uh, a microphone that only picks up whatever is like one inch in front of it, which is why it always looks like I'm, I'm like, um, you know, like, oh my precious, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, it's that's why I'm up on the mic all the time. You guys can't hear it, but I can hear it full on well. Actually, you know what I might do? Hold on one second. Let's let's keep doing this. We might go old school for a second. It's all about contingency plan, y'all. It's all about contingency planning. Got to have a backup. Got to have a backup. Let's see. Most organizations identify high OT risk levels. A new survey from Otorio and ServiceNow found that 58% of C-level executives characterize their OT cybersecurity risk as either high or critical levels. Despite this recognition, action on OT security seems to lag. Only 47% of organizations maintained an OT cybersecurity solution. The vast majority, 81%, still managed OT risk manually. Half of all respondents said they had established a team to develop an OT strategy, which means they haven't actually created one yet. This comes as almost all organizations, 93%, saw a significant increase in regulations impacting operations in the last year. Okay, so this is definitely helping. I hear the dogs less. Um... Okay, I think Robert Burke asked to go a little bit deeper on this story. So guys, really quickly, <clears throat> OT is operational technology. This is typically some type of tech that is moving physical systems. So think of um, think of it uh, like a manufacturing plant that is mixing chemicals and it needs to vent off some chemical after it's cleaned or whatever into the air. Well, something needs to physically tell the vent to open up and close. Something needs to tell it to mix a certain amount of lye in the water, right? Like these are cyber physical systems and this is what operational technology is. IT is what we're all familiar with. Information technology is, you know, packets and data and all these applications and stuff like that. OT, yes, there are applications in OT. You do use some type of like application to visually see the manufacturing process or the chemical process or the energy and oil and gas process or whatever it is. But, you know, you're, you're, you're affecting physical systems. Now, OT has its own protocols, right? So we do like TCP, IP, and we're really familiar with that, SMTP or like whatever, APIs, sending data across the, the net, the information superhighway. OT has things like Modbus and SCADA and PLCs, which PLC isn't a protocol, but my point is they have their own specific technologies and protocols and standards. And it, OT is its own discipline. It is, is its own focus. You may also hear it referred to as industrial control systems. Uh, just really quick, if you are interested in this, Dragos, Dragos is like the pi, like the leader in the space on OT security. So if you're looking to get more information and dive in, Dragos is really good. Don Weber from Cutaway Security, Cutaway Sec. If you look up Don Weber, he is also another um, leader. He teaches the SANS course on industrial control system security. Bryson Bort, while he does a lot more than just industrial control systems and OT, his 
roots are in that space and he's a he's a leader in that space so those are three different groups that you should consider if you want to learn more about this um clint bowdungeon wrote the book on hacking industrial control systems so that's another resource for you um uh, so oh, okay what i meant to ask about why are sea levels accepting this higher risk i want to get into it oh, okay so the final thing this story right here is saying 50 percent of organizations claim higher critical ot security risk levels okay here's the deal most ot is old technology right old technology didn't have cybersecurity introduced to it it's bolted on afterwards if it's bolted on at all a lot of people operating these systems are engineers and field people who don't frankly want to deal with the bureaucracy of security they've been you know doing these systems for some time they don't see the risk of nation state threat actors messing with it um and you know it's just it, that's what it is plus when you look at what it costs and this is probably Great cash, homie. uh hacking ics by clint bow dungeon joshua allen when you look at what it costs to upfit a organization to have their ot security improved it is very expensive if possible at all so when 58 percent of organizations are claiming high or critical ot risk it's partially a cost-based decision. They're not they're not down with having that level of risk, but they are unable to fund it properly. I, I'm talking like tech from the 70s. A lot of systems and processes are built in, ve like very tightly coupled with the overall workflow of how it, a, a plant, whether it's creating energy, cleaning water, you know, manufacturing pennies, like whatever it is those systems are tightly coupled and it would be unbelievably expensive to upfit it for security and this is actually one of the challenges of chief information security officers guys you got to remember you got to remember this okay when we do our job well like seriously take this away if you're new here take this away okay the better we do our job the less it looks like we're doing what like so so to put it plainly like say we're crushing it we are crushing it as infosec professionals well then the the ceo the cfo when we're like hey we, our ot security is pretty bad like we really need like 30 million dollars to really fix this in in two years and they're like well nothing nothing's happening nothing like we don't have issues i i why do you want 30 million dollars to upfit this at the end of the day they are going to see it as $30 million of expense with zero impact to pro production or quality of product or anything. $30 million of InfoSec does not make better pennies. It does not make the pennies come out of the manufacturing plant faster. It does not make money. So it's seen as a total expense. And it's like, ah, I think we're good here, right? And by the way, this is also why organizations give a blank check when an incident occurs because they feel the pain and they see the actual impact and it resonates with them as like oh crap this is a real thing like what is it going to take to make this pain not happen again that's what's going on with this if i had to speculate tinfoil hat and now a word from our sponsor normalize Normalize is a cloud data security platform that continuously discovers sensitive data and their access paths across your cloud environments. Normalize provides the ability to analyze, prioritize, and respond to data threats to prevent damaging data breaches. Their cloud native platform manages data security posture and compliance by automatically tracking risk to sensitive data, visually showing teams who can access what, and quickly block unauthorized access or vulnerable points of attack. Discover, visualize, and secure your cloud data in minutes with Normalize Freemium. Go to normalize.ai. All right. Twitter runs. It's the mid roll, so let's holla, holla, holla. Did I add Bender? I think I added Bender, didn't I? Oh no, I, I added Cream. We got one more emote. I kind of want to add Bender um, from Breakfast Club. All right, guys, it is the mid-roll. I want to thank all of you for being here. How many people we got? 230 people live in chat right now, getting their top cyber headlines and engaging with each other in a meaningful, deliberate way. 
If you got value so far, if you're being entertained, if you like the music, hit the like button, not for my own benefit, but so other people can find this content, right? If you ever go on YouTube and you search for cybersecurity stuff, Google's starting to make a profile for you. You guys all are watching on YouTube, most of you, and it's it's YouTube's aware that you're a cyber person and you're watching, so it's gonna reach out to other cyber people. So hit the like button. That's how you tell YouTube that this is good content and you want other people to find out. Thank you to the stream sponsors, Barricade, Panopsi, and as I mentioned earlier, XM Cyber. Guys, let's talk about it for a minute. Everybody's got misconfigurations, vulnerabilities, mismanaged creds, exposures across both your on-prem and your cloud infrastructure, and it's really difficult to see all of them and how they interrelate. Threat actors can see them and how they interrelate. XM Cyber has helped us out here by introducing a way for us to view this in a meaningful way. So instead of looking at these silo pockets and having mismanaged teams, not mismanaged teams, but teams operating independently, XM Cyber uh, abstracts all that information up and provi provi provides an attack graph, which gives a, gives a visual representation of what an attack path or all your attack paths can look like, what a threat actor would do to get into your system across cloud and on-prem. And they do it in a very cool visual way. You can actually pinpoint and prioritize the choke points where uh, the threat actors would have to go, to go through to get to your crown jewels and your sensitive assets. This actually um, allows you to focus your energy, effort, resources, and time into doing massive cyber risk reduction versus just patching all the things, right? You can be deliberate. It gives you laser-focused remediation, which is super, super valuable, okay? So if you want to reduce your attack surface, if you want to sleep easier at night, visit xmcyber.com, link in the description below. Take, a, take a, a roll, a run through their exposure management platform. Believe me, guys, Exposure management is is like, it's where we're going, okay? Threat exposure management is the future. And the, like, I'm, I'm not like this product, all product, like this is where we're going as an industry. So check out xmcyber.com and uh, see what it's all about. All right, I wanna holler. Uh, it really quick, the Simply Cyber newsletter. Um, my, if you want to get a, an email every Monday and another one during the week, <laughs> Go to simplycyber.io slash newsletter. Uh, I send an email out on Mondays. I'm also started sending out a threat intelligence email per industry every week as well in a partnership with Codename Purple. Uh, we're just beta testing it right now. I was supposed to send it yesterday. I was supposed to send it today. Guys, I am, this is what it looks like when you're maxed out, okay? I am maxed out. I'm maxed out. So the you will get an email at some point from code from me in collaboration with Codename Purple, and then we're going to take a break on that for a few weeks um, until I get the shed and the fence and everything done. I, I am I am I'm overwhelmed right now. Okay, so stay tuned for that. Sign up at simplycyber.io/newsletter to get it. Please do that, guys. The Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Our very own haircut fish Dan Reardon is rocking the mic right now on the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Dan, if you can tag someone, let me know. He did tell me who he wants to tag. Um, I'll just tell you. Dan Reardon wants to tag uh, Cyber Ninja. Cyber Ninja, uh, you have been tagged. Go on LinkedIn. Thank you, Haircut Fish. Go on LinkedIn, Cyber Ninja. Put hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Post your why on uh, LinkedIn and everybody in chat connect with Cyber Ninja on the post. You can find it by searching for hashtag simply cyber community challenge. Take this opportunity to build your professional network. Okay, guys, simply cyber could close down tomorrow. I want you to have a takeaway. I want you to have your own um, professional network. This is a great way to do it. Okay, get in, get after it. All right, the final thing I'll say. Um, is every Thursday is Dan Reardon's haircut fish uh, meme of the week. I, I, you know, I don't screen it. I don't approve or deny it. It just comes in hot. I do get to see it right before you guys, though. Here we go. Here I am. Uh, been working on the studio in the backyard on Tuesday night. My wife and I had to rip down a bunch of shed. I had to dig out concrete posts from the ground. I got shredded. There we go. So thank you very much, Haircut Fish, uh, for a great, great meme of the week, as always. So funny. So funny. 
Stay tuned for updates on the jawjacking section on The Shed. Thanks so much, guys. Let's get back to the news, okay? Foul of Germany's Network Enforcement Act. Germany's Federal Justice Office began a proceeding against Twitter under the country's Network Enforcement Act. This law requires responding to user reports of illegal content, like hate speech, within seven days. The Justice Office found indications of a systemic failure in the provider's complaint management. A district court judge would need to rule on if the regulator's charges are valid. If so, Twitter could face fines of up to 50 million euros. It should be noted the Network Enforcement Act has been on the books since 2017, but regulators have been wary of issuing fines for violations so far. Okay, so this has been an an, an ongoing thing, right? So Twitter... Um, has the capability, right, to flag malicious speech, flag malicious posts. Um, I will say, you know, some posts are obviously hate speech. Some posts are obviously inappropriate. Uh, But there is a gray area, right? So maybe I say something that's not, you know, technically hate speech, right? Uh, And there's some interpretation. And maybe to me, it's okay, but to you, it's not. So there becomes this subjective thing. In this instance, I didn't see the post. I I would have to imagine that they are, you know, any reasonable person would identify them as hate. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not condoning this. I'm not saying like whatever the tweets were, were acceptable. What I am saying is that um, it, I don't know, there's a gray area, right? Um, So I, I do think that Twitter has the capabilities to flag these and find these with the way AI is going. Shall we play a game? Um, with the way AI is going, um, they should be able to flag these and have someone go through it. Um, so, you know, if Germany finds them 50 million euros, that's a, that's a lot of money. I mean, how, like what's 50, 50 million euros, uh, to USD. That's $54 million. I mean, that's not, I mean, that's, that's not like super cheap. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not going to drive Twitter out of business, but I mean, that's still not nothing. Right. So, uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'll stay tuned on this one, but this is, this is a really tough topic. I mean, guys, when you, in, when you introduce a platform that's designed for open speech, right. And I'm not saying like you know, like inappropriate, anything goes kind of speech. But like, you know, if if in public discourse, you're going to have different opinions, different perspectives, and you would hope in an ideal situation that everybody respects everybody's opinion. But when you start introducing just hate speech and, you know, you know, just, just not, not public discourse, but just mean hate, uh, bigotry, et cetera, it, it's unacceptable. And, um, you know, it's part of the reason people are, leaving Twitter, right? So hopefully they get this sorted out. Hopefully the fine helps do that. There was some talk about this uh, in the United States a couple months ago too as well. So hopefully it's getting sorted out. They definitely have the technology to do it. HP to patch critical printer bug within three months. HP sent out a security bulletin advising of a critical severity vulnerability impacting about 50 HP LaserJet and managed printer models. The bug could allow an attacker to access data transmitted between the printers and another device on the network, like when you send any print job. To do so, printers must run the FutureSmart firmware version 5.6 and enable IPsec. Despite the advisory, HP did not provide a fix. Instead, it said it will release a firmware update within 90 days to resolve the issue. Admins can also downgrade printer firmware to avoid the issue as well. All right. So here's the deal. This is a tough one to, um, this is a tough one to tackle. So basically HP laser jets have a critical bug, um, that can be exploited. Um, any red team members, uh, any threat actors in the audience, um, any, uh, pen testers, et cetera. I feel like printers, you know, historically printers have been a really soft target, right? Like it people, it admins, network admins, they're not typically looking at printers. They're looking at everything else, but printers are a foothold. Printers are an opportunity. And in this case, you know, this printer, it, it's it, just like the 3CX phones, man, like printers are assets, endpoints on the network that can be used as footholds, can be used as lateral movements. Um, so, you know, this is what it is. Now they say that, uh, you know, any environment I've worked in, 
you know, I haven't seen the printers get their firmware updated. Printers are like, set it and forget it, which is not the best solution. It's not the best way to do it, but I'm just being real. Like every, you know, I've been in this game 20 years, right? Like I can't think of the last time I personally have patched a printer or know of anyone uh, updating a printer's firmware, right? So it, these are kind of soft targets. Um, the fact that you can downgrade the firmware in order to protect it, um, you know, I don't know if anyone's going to do that. Yeah, if Kev Tech's here, I'd love his thoughts on printers. I mean, he's definitely got a, a ton of information and experience on that. Um, you know, one funny thing about printers, though, like back in the day, um, when you do a vulnerability scan, if you hit an HP laser jet, it would just spew out papers. Um, that's kind of funny. Uh, there was actually um, a funny, funny, um, not funny, but like uh, a cyber attack back. There, there, there was a, a pew pew or pew pew pie or something like that or pew do pie. Um, so, some some vulnerability on printers. Somebody exploited in a support of pew do pie. Uh, I think that's his name back in the day where it would, he like this, this um, hacker basically pushed out to all the printers that could um, paper, like a printout that said something like vote for PewDiePie or something like that. Um, or PewDiePie or whatever. Yeah. So a anyways, um, that was really funny. That was really funny uh, when that happened. If you guys are interested in that, um, let me just show you really quickly. PewDiePie, Pew, or PewDiePie, whatever his name is. Uh, HP printer hack vote. Let's see. Yeah, this is from 2018. Someone hacked war printers were like, urging people to subscribe to PewDiePie. Like basically this hacker found all the publicly facing printers and then pushed out uh, a print job to all of them, which is very similar to like what this is saying. Like you can access and do things to these HP printers because they're vulnerable. Um, so anyways, patch your stuff in 90 days. If you were even patching your printers in the first place. GPT used to create stega. The final thing I'll say about this, you should definitely not have any printers internet facing, by the way. Pornography malware. Forcepoint Solutions architect Aaron Mulgrew demonstrated how to use ChatGPT to create malware without writing any code. Mulgrew successfully used the AI chatbot to create a tool able to search a system for specific files then break them up and insert them into an image file before uploading them to Google Drive. It took about four hours of work using simple prompts. He cautioned this isn't a new malware approach, but that ChatGPT did allow him to minimize the footprint to the current detection tools out there today. After tweaking the code using ChatGPT, Mulgrew submitted the code to VirusTotal with no vendors marking it as suspicious. Obviously, that that is the biggest... Shall we play a game? Okay, so first of all, First of all, let let's be real here. Like let's let's address this part. Where is it? Zero detections on virus total. Guys, this is misleading. Okay. So if you don't know what virus total is, virus total is like one of the tools that practitioners use where you can just if you find some random artifact on your network or you know, a URL someone sends you and you want to check it out, you can use VirusTotal, which is basically a database lookup of known malicious, known bad files, right? So when this individual writes, has ChatGPT write malware and it has zero detections on VirusTotal, no kidding it has zero detections. You literally just wrote it. It hasn't been seen in the wild. So to me, like, this is like the most obvious statement possible and slightly misleading. Ma Hold on. Mulgrew uploaded the code to virus total and he found five vendors marked the file as suspicious. Okay, so it must be um, some of the behaviors it's detecting is suspicious, but like most times, as far as I know, virus total is doing a lookup. Um, and I'll look back at um, your all's um, comments after this. Maybe I'm getting it wrong, but to me, like that, that's obvious. Okay, so here's the final thing I'll say about that. ChatGPT, while it is AI, while it is amazing, while it is all these things, and it's trained on models, the models are written by humans. The guardrails put in place are written by humans. Humans are, are 
fallible, fallible. Humans make mistakes. Okay. So whatever guardrails you put in place, there will be ways to break them. There will be ways around them, right? Guardrails probably protect for 80% of all scenarios and situations. And this is actually where pen testers thrive. This is where ethical hackers thrive. This is where criminals thrive, is understanding that 20% fringe in how you can manipulate abuse and all those things. So it doesn't surprise me that someone was able to discover ways around the guardrails. Um, very, very cool um, and not surprising. So, you know, again, with this um, group of people who, the 1,100 people who signed a petition to slow down AI for six months so we can actually look at it and figure it out. This is just another reason why, okay? If you say straight up, write malware, it can't, it won't be done. But if you if you prompt it to do different pieces, the chat GPT isn't gonna see that it's building an overall solution. It's just building parts of a solution, okay? Uh, the final thing I'll say is this. You gotta remember guys, like a lot of malware has behaviors that would be legit anyways, right? So like if I install um, some type of like remote access Trojan solution into your network, well, remote access tools are used by IT administration people all day, every day. That's how we get into Carl's box, Carl! right? So that's not malicious. What makes it malicious is the intent of the user using it to access a system in an unauthorized way. ChatGPT doesn't have context of who the person is requesting this code be developed. So you're gonna run into a lot of like issues where it's very gray on why you're asking for this software to be developed by the AI. And in those wrinkles is where you can have it make malware. Just don't call it malware, call it software. Thumbs up, right? Well, ChatGPT will be happy to help you with that. Shall we play a game? More data leaked in Oakland breach. The city of Oakland confirmed that the Play Ransomware organization leaked a second batch of stolen data on its leak site. Researchers say this includes 600 gigabytes of data, including Oakland Police Department files, some of which contain confidential information, like disciplinary records and medical histories. The initial data leak in early March now looks comparatively modest at 10 gigabytes. The city did not disclose any ransomware demands from the play group, hmm. given though that this is the second data leak, it appears whatever they are, the city didn't pay them. Hold on. We talk the, uh, the link um, on the blog is incorrect. The link on the blog is incorrect. Hold on a second. I got to do this manually myself. All right, here we go. Oakland confirms massive second data leak after February ransomware attack. Okay, so basically the player ransomware group, obviously the city of Oakland uh, probably gave them a, a double finger salute uh, when they asked for their ransom. And play is just playing out their playbook. Wow, triple word score there. Um, play is playing out their playbook on what they need to do. The ransomware threat actor groups need to adhere to their, uh, to their threats or else they risk the... The, 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 they risk the situation of being exposed as not a real threat, right? So if I tell you, hey, you better pay up or I'm going to leak all your data, and you're like, I'm not going to pay, and then I don't leak your data, then <laughs> like the victim wins, right? So, so which, which is good, but, but the threat actor groups need to release the data in order for the next victim to be able to research them and see... Um, and see that it's legit. Yeah, no, I I understand Joel Belton. So the FBI has made it so like government cannot pay the ransom because you're basically like funding terrorism and, and it's just not allowed to pay ransoms. But play ransomware group in this instance, A, <laughs> A should have known that city, state, local, federal aren't going to pay ransoms and that it was not a good target to hit. But now that they've hit them, they have to release the data. They have to follow through on their threats in order to maintain legitimacy of them being a threat. So I'm not surprised here. I mean, it sucks, obviously. Um, but, you know, they said there was a bunch of data in here. Basically, the city of Oakland is basically just going to execute... Um, you know, incident response, right? So they're going to notify people. You're going to get your... Um, your identity theft, monitoring, 
there'll be an uptick in activity around potential phishing and threats. And then, you know, everybody will go be back to everything. And then they'll just, you know, it'll just be a footnote in history. You remember when Oakland got hit? Guys, this isn't like new, okay? Like Atlanta ransomware, 2018, right? Baltimore ransomware, 2019, right? Dude, cities, states. I mean, I, I could I could find one 2020 and 2021, two, three, right? It, it, this isn't new. This is not new ground, okay? <laughs> like this is state, I mean, it sucks because the state local governments, just like federal, um, are, are, you know, not set up for success. Um, frankly, they, they, they're understaffed, they're overworked. They have a million running around in their environment and it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Okay. So, uh, just be mindful of this. If you are in Oakland, your data has probably been leaked and, but you probably already know quite a bit about it. Okay. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today's news. I, I do want to share a couple quick things with you. If you were here just for the news, uh, before you go, I want to share... I want to share something with you really quickly. Later today, um, I've got a really, a real special banger for you. Today at... Oh my gosh, come on. Today at 4.30 p.m., my guest on Simply Cyber Live, which is a long-form guest interview, um, one hour... Oh my God. A one-hour long um, show. We're having Mike Warner on. This guy it was a CISO for like... 15 years for Oshkosh and not Oshkosh Bagosh, okay? Not children's corduroy overalls, okay? He was the CISO of Oshkosh, which makes like wicked heavy construction machinery. Next time you're driving behind like a dump truck or uh, someone pulling like a cement mixer, look and you'll see the word Oshkosh, okay? They got a massive footprint. This dude has hired and fired hundreds of people okay he is coming on and the entire focus you're gonna love this especially if you're trying to break into the industry we are going to be talking about as a CISO, as someone hiring people as someone putting out job recs what is it that he looks for okay so like legit no nonsense questions like hey mike warner is a network plus certification on a resume do anything for you does a security plus on a resume do anything for you? Do you prefer seeing people with a college degree or four years of practical experience? We're going to ask him the real questions and get his real thoughts on what it means. Again, you know, I've hired people. I've worked in a CISO capacity, not nearly to the extent that this guy has. And he's got a wealth of knowledge. We are going to go bananas all up on Mike Warner. So join us. It will be a quick stream. Callan, my son, has soccer practice at 5.30. So it'll be a 45-minute stream. So we're going to jump right into it at 4.30. Don't be late. You're going to get massive value from that. All right, that's going to do it for the stream today. Um, if you were here just for the news, peace out. Thank you so very much, 226 of you. I bid you good day, Cyber Ninja. Thank you so much. Mike Darrington in the house. What's up, Mike? All right, guys, I do have a few minutes. Let me check my, my calendar and see if I have an 11 Eastern. Oh, I do. Guys, look at my calendar. Like, that's my calendar. <sighs> Damn. I do have an 11, but I can talk for a few minutes. I didn't even get breakfast this morning. Um, all right, guys, so let's jaw jack for a minute. Um, did, did I say I was going to talk about something? I don't even remember. I feel like I did. I'm in Eastern time zone, Liam. Yeah, Neon Nomad. Actually, I do have a vacation coming up. Uh, surprise. See, see, all the good intel comes out during jaw jacking. So you guys will have, um, you guys will have, actually, <laughs> Oh my God, I do have a vacation coming up with the family, but I will be doing the live stream from the vacation. Okay, <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, April 20th and 21st, you guys will have a special guest host 
Eric Taylor from Barricade Cyber Solutions has agreed to do the uh, live stream for me. I have to travel out to San Diego for um, for work, for, for my my private bit, my personal business, and um, I won't be able to do it because actually actually um, I think April twenty first I'll be able to do it because it'll be five a.m. Um, it'll be five a.m. Eastern. Actually, who knows? Maybe I will just do it while I'm out there. We'll see. We'll see. Um, anyways, Eric Taylor's at, at the ready to be able to jump in on a moment's notice, but uh, right now I'm not. Sh okay, so the shed. Uh, people are asking about the shed. Okay, so guys, the shed got delivered yesterday. I am making a little bit of a video uh, for you guys on the shed development, but here, I'll just show you a, a quick picture if you're interested. Um, can I do this? Where's my mod chat? I'll bring it up. All right, this is this. Where is it? Oh my god! I'm looking for the pictures, y'all. All right, hold on one second. I can show you a picture of of the uh, shed. Sorry, guys. Um. Okay. So this is this is the beginning. Okay. This is the beginning. Um, is this, what are we doing? Here we go. Okay. Obviously this is, this is early. Okay guys, but that, that's it. I know it, like this fence is getting replaced and everything's happening, but this is what it's going to look like. Okay. Again, this is very early. It still needs to have HVAC, electrical, sheetrock, um, soundproofing, um, a million other things, but this is, this is, this is it. Um, So that's the, uh, the, <laughs> that's the, uh, tech town outpost studio shed command center presented by Red Bull. <laughs> yeah. N Nadine wants to call it the dog house. <laughs> What's my next race? I don't have a scheduled race. All right. No H O uh, no H O A drama. I, I I put in a request, you know, nine months ago, <laughs> and I got it all approved and everything. G R C interview questions. Um, William, if it was me, uh, I would advise going to the G R C analyst masterclass and just running back through the risk assessment uh, lessons, the risk the risk section, and probably um, the policy section. The C spot, <laughs> Jesse. That's funny. The old hack shack, the cyber cave. Oh, you guys are good. Thanks, William Welch. My pleasure. I need to get up there and help with some landscaping on the exterior. Yeah, Kimberly, for sure. Nadine's got some some good ideas uh, for landscaping. We might even do some lattice work with some jasmine. Sea shed is a great suggestion. Oh, the sea shed because it's like she shed. That's funny. That is funny. I don't know if I like it though. The jaw shack. Have I dabbled in cloud soul shine? I mean, I've administered Office 365 environments and my labs are typically built in AWS, but I I'm not certified or anything like that. Cloud's its own thing for real. Cloud is a real massive area. It's great. It's still a great opportunity um, if you're like looking to kind of carve out a niche for yourself in InfoSec, uh, cloud is still like a hot area to target a uh, lot of, there's a lot of, I don't want to say attack surface, but there's a lot of like businesses operating in the cloud, uh, that don't know what they're doing. And because, uh, because a lot of like senior it people have been in the industry for 20 years, they're used to on-prem and like traditional infrastructure. So when you introduce platform as a service, they can't wrap their head around it. So you can actually get a jump start on those people and be able to deliver value to an organization um, and not have 20 years of experience. Yeah, Jordan Turney. Yeah, well, guys, my OPSEC is terrible. If you've been a regular um, on Simply Cyber, you know exactly where I live. Um, yeah, hybrid definitely, hybrid definitely seems to be more of the reality than full cloud. All right. 
Everything's good. Oh, that's good. GBOR it's saying that the Jasmine can get wicked heavy. That's good feedback. Good to know. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joel Belton. Yeah, my OPSEC's terrible. Uh, I surprisingly see very few job postings for cloud positions, though. I did see it mentioned within other roles, though. That's a good point. Hey, let's ask Mike Warner later today on the stream uh, where he values cloud and cloud experience. That would be a really good question. Oh, Kimberly, thank you. That's a really good point. I forget. Sometimes I forget about all the content I made. Uh, Erica McDuffie and I did GRC interviews. You'll have to listen to the roof getting put on my house in that video, though. They were like literally nailing a roof to right above my head. Take it easy, Dash. EC Council CCT cert. Um, I would I would say no. That's a subjective. My opinion. I do not speak for the entire industry when I say that I don't I don't I don't even know that what that cert is. Um, Amazon for cloud jobs. Yep. Taylor called it. What's what did Taylor call? Well, it's time for me to go. Take it easy, Joel Belton. Thank you, Allison. All right, guys. I think it's about time. I think it's about time that we uh, did this. But hey, thanks everybody again. Uh, stay tuned for Simply Cyber. Um, Simply Cyber Con updates as they come. Stay tuned for Shed updates as they come. Hopefully you guys, Alana, actually, I guess I am doing the jaw jacking. Alana, I didn't get a chance to watch your video yesterday. I hope it went well. Did anybody get to attend Alana's stream yesterday? I, I would love to know how it went. Have a great day. Have a great day. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Liam. That's very, very kind of you. Yes, Paris Gatsby's in the house. Thank you uh, again to Joel Belton for the gifted squad subs. All right, cool. I'm, I'm glad that there was good representation. Alana killed it. Good. That's great. Oh, cool. Nice job, Alana. Well, well done. Cool. All right, guys, that's going to do it. Thank you all so very much. Be good. And until 4.30 p.m. today for Mike Warner interview, stay secure. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>